Well, everyone, Sten Morgan here. Welcome to the podcast, Becoming an Elite Financial Advisor. Today, we are going to answer listener questions and also questions that were submitted by our community of advisors. So as we get all these questions, I'm going to try to bunch them. Uh, a lot of similar questions with some different nuances. Uh, let's dive right in. So the first question, uh, we get, we had a handful of questions about hiring uh, or org charts. Is there a rule of thumb for financial advisor practice as it progresses? Uh, or is it specific to your team, your area, and what you want to accomplish? I believe there is a path that can be followed for the first couple stages of an advisor practice. So within my story, like many advisors, I started out by myself. What this would look like is if you had an org chart, it would be Sten and everything underneath it. Paperwork, client meetings, scheduling meetings, uh, building plans, everything that was required to run a financial advisory practice that had some insurance, AUM. Uh, Earlier in my career, I didn't have financial planning that developed later on, which was required additional skill sets and people on the team. So step one, let's all agree to some degree, you start as a solo advisor in many cases. Step two, what I started looking at was what are the things I'm doing that are non-revenue generating? That if I'm living within my superpower, I should not be doing. Typically, that's like 60 or 70% of the activities you're doing, you probably can delegate or stop doing. So for me, the natural progression was uh, an administrative assistant. It wasn't a good use of my time for my clients if I was filling out paperwork, moving money, scheduling meetings. So it was a very obvious next step for me. So version two of Legacy was Sten and Jamie. Version three, as I looked at my schedule again, I said, what are the things now that I'm left with that are not the best use of my time? And within my practice, those became the advisor-related tasks that I didn't feel comfortable giving to Jamie because it wasn't her skill set or really what she enjoyed doing. It was things like meeting prep, project managing tasks for clients that were planning-related, building out some degree of financial plan or cash flow in preparation for a meeting. So that's when I hired a pair planner. So version three of Legacy, Sten, Jamie, and Chris at the time was the pair planner. That's a pretty strong team. You can you can manage a lot of people and do pretty good work with a team of three people like that. What I then realized is that as a lead advisor, I didn't have the time I wanted to for the practice to grow. I couldn't necessarily give a lot more to Chris or a lot more to Jamie because they were more full-time advisor type things. And so the next iteration of Legacy was another full-time advisor that had his own book of business, uh, but was also able to lean on Jamie and Chris because I didn't have enough clients at the time to keep them fully busy to maximize his practice as well. So version four, two advisors, admin, and paraplanner. As our business started growing, and this is where it would be personal to your business, if you were really heavy in insurance, you may say, we have a lot of servicing activities, so we need another admin person. But you'd never want to wait until somebody's at 100% capacity to hire somebody else to help them. So if you get a sense that your paraplanner or your admin is at 80, 90% capacity, and they're close to maybe being overwhelmed, that's when you maybe need to start looking at expanding that role, adding another person. So you may have two administrative assistants or two junior advisors or pair planners. So once we had another senior advisor, a pair planner, and Jamie on the team doing admin paperwork, I started realizing there was a lot of things that had to do with the business that were weighing me down. Uh, Was payroll getting done correctly? Were 401ks getting funded for people? Uh, Was rent getting paid on the building? Was I negotiating the next lease? All these things that did not help me become a better advisor, but were necessary to run the company. At that point, that's when Jamie was elevated to practice manager and we backfilled the admin role. So at that point, we have practice manager, admin, pair planner, and two active advisors. The next progression for us was, okay, how do we want to manage money? That led to a portfolio manager. And then at this point, we have a great system. We think we can serve more people. And then that was a a marketing hire, somebody to kind of help us uh, package our message and get in front of people. So the, the, the response to these questions about org charts or how do I delegate? We got a lot of questions about delegation or even the question of who should I hire next? I do believe it will present itself to you. If you look at the things that are, that are stopping you from living in your superpower, which for a lot of us advisors is meeting with clients, prospecting, or, or building a plan to some degree with our expertise, that will inform what your next hire should be. 
Uh, okay, let's move on to um, the great question here. How do you fill your prospect pipeline when you're in a new town? So at EAN, we've developed what we call the prospecting spectrum. And it's really a full circle spectrum of all the potential categories or approaches that an advisor can use to prospect. One of them is brute force, which a lot of us have done before. Just I'm going to call a bunch of people, use my natural market, just I'm going to do average activity harder and longer. And I believe eventually it'll work out. The idea if you you know, are playing baseball and you want to get more hits, you don't really focus on improving your swing. You just say, I want to get more at bats. I prefer to have a really high batting average. And so while I started in brute force, which was a list of the 200 people I knew and just calling on them, I wanted to move out of that as quickly as possible. So with an EAN, we teach what we call targeting strategies. What I believe is there's a lot of people out there that have a problem. If you can be the person to go and find the solution and bring it to them, that is a great way to make a connection. I was always hesitant to be the relationship advisor, meaning I hope you like me. We go to church together. Our kids play sports together. Let's do business together and hope it works out. I I think of this as kind of the, you don't have another alternative approach, or I just hope you like me better than your other advisor. It can work. I've met a lot of advisors that are just fun to be around and they're just really social and they get business that way. That was not my natural strength. I, I do not get filled up by going and doing a bunch of social events. And so I went more of the technical route. I said, I'm going to go learn new things, whether it's for business owners, physicians, uh, architects, real estate investors. And I'm going to go find ideas, whether it's uh, investment strategies, tax strategies, maybe some estate planning strategies. And I'm going to practice these concepts and get to know them so well that if I can get in front of somebody, I can impress them with our process or what I know. And so if I was in a new market and I can go back in time, when I moved to Nashville, I didn't know anybody and I had to kind of figure this out the hard way, is I would focus on targeting strategies. I would say, I'm going to go out there and find these ideas and I'm going to go find the people that have really busy lives that don't have the time to sort all these things out. And I'm going to bring this idea to them. And by bringing value first, I'm going to create a relationship that really all I need is the first meeting. If I can call somebody, it's a cold call, but I say, I believe you have this problem. I have the solution, and here's the potential outcome if you take action, which we call quantifying the benefit of the idea. The chance of you getting that meeting, that might take your batting average from, you know, getting one hit out of every 10 at bats to maybe seven. Seven out of 10 at bats, people will say, wow, that's that's helpful. Thank you. I'm happy to meet with you. So I would look in your area and say, where where are people hanging out that have a similar problem that you can go research and find the solution and you can bring it to them? The next problem that creates to some degree for advisors is we're usually not great marketers, meaning the information we have sometimes gets in the way of us getting business because we think about it as an advisor, not as a client or potential prospect. And so we have to take our advisor hat off and put our marketing hat on. What would it require if you were the client for somebody to present an idea to you in a compelling way that would want you to give them time? which is a meeting. You're asking them for your time. And so you can bump into people in the community. You can be part of networking groups. You can get referrals from CPAs and attorneys. I don't think any of that stuff is bad, but it's typically usually average. I would prefer to find ideas myself, research where those people are that need that idea, and then get creative about presenting it to them. So we spent a lot of time in our How to Charge Live event talking about prospecting. How do you go find these ideas and how do you deliver them? Prospecting is the lifeblood of advisors. It's one of the core pillars of EAN that we teach on. Uh, We want to make sure you have a great process and you deliver on the things you promise, but you always need people coming in the door. So the challenge here, and we do this spectrum a lot with our advisors we coach, is there's average or elite. And imagine on one side of the spectrum is average and you're trying to move to the elite side. Most of our initial ideas when it comes to prospecting are pretty average. I'm going to hold a seminar. Okay, well, a lot of advisors have had seminars before. What's the difference between an average seminar and an elite seminar? You may say, I want to get referrals from my clients. Okay, there's an average way to do that. And then there's an elite way to do that. And so we'll at times get on a whiteboard with our advisors and we'll put average on one side and elite on the other. And we'll say, okay, what's your idea? And we'll plot it on the timeline. 
And I'm going to say, okay, what's the next iteration of it? And every iteration, every version of that idea usually gets better. And so if you have an idea when it comes to prospecting, I would challenge you to get in a room, get on a whiteboard and plot it out, right? Average and then write elite. Plot the first idea and then try to force yourself to iterate it until it gets better and better and better. Prospecting is one of the hardest, most frustrating things in our business, but it is necessary. It's a, it's a muscle we all need to flex because it, it, you need your business to grow. And then you'll hire more people. And then to be profitable, you'll still want to grow. Uh, what happened with legacy in the past is I was the primary rainmaker. And so as the firm grew and I had more clients and I started focusing on them, I realized that Sten's efforts alone were not keeping up. We, we were, our growth was slowing. And so it put legacy more in a season of what strategies of prospecting can we create that don't require Sten or his natural market? which is a great problem to have to solve when I'm busy with clients, but it's still difficult. So you know, as, as everyone takes on the prospecting challenge, my hope is, is you're not settling, uh, that you would lean in, You know, call us. We have a lot of prospecting ideas. We have hundreds of advisors we coach and we're getting ideas from them all the time. But if you sit on your own and just keep doing average behavior, you'll keep getting average, average results. All right, next category here we'll jump into Somebody asked me, what books do I most gift away? Uh, we have a long list of books that we build for our advisors. I believe great business owners read. Some of the best epiphanies I've had is from reading a book. Partly that's getting away and finding the time to do it and just being in that creative mindset. Uh, but also there's just these little sparks and books uh, that at times hit me. And even if it's not the core idea of the author, it kind of brings up a new idea with my mind for the practice or prospecting or another book. And so when I think about the books that have impacted me the most in the last year or two, uh, the first one is Who Not How. Really well-written book about delegation, kind of living in your superpower. As an early entrepreneur, I just wanted to do a lot of things. And so whenever I had an idea, I would just throw it on my plate, another thing on my plate. And what I didn't fully realize until these things, you know, until I've gotten to five, six ideas at a time, is that I wasn't doing any of them really well. They're all doing okay, but nothing was great. And so if I want to do great things, I have to either stop doing some or delegate those other things. And so what I love about books like Who Not How is that it's a principle that once you internalize it, you, you look at things forever different. And so instead of saying, how can Sten do more things? It shifted my thinking to who can help Sten do more things. So this book helped me hire people, uh, helped me give away more things. It got me really focused on Sten. What is the highest and best use of your time for your company, for your family? And then can you identify things you should stop doing? But then the things that are left that you know are important, instead of Sten trying to do it when it's not my superpower, whether it's marketing, uh, even process and paperwork, I, I could probably figure it out, but I'm not the best one to do it. I need to go find my who in that. So, so great book around delegation, living in your superpower, who, not how. Uh, another book that was personally really impactful for me was Not Nice. This was another great principle for me that you can be kind, but you don't always have to be nice. Because anybody listening that's, that's running a business, it's hard. Uh, and you can't make everybody happy, whether that's clients or even team members. And in the past, my desire to be liked as a leader caused me to let people stay on the team too long. I probably kept clients that weren't a great fit for too long. And once I, that book gave me permission to say, oh, you can still handle things well. If there's a team member that's not a good fit and they're frustrated and you're frustrated, it's not kind to keep them on the team. But what is kind is you can help them transition, give them a severance of some kind. You can even write them a recommendation for another job. You can help them find another job. You can still be true to who you are and be kind, but but being nice at times does not get you the results you want. Uh, the third book is Essentialism, another kind of principle book that impacted me. I would say I was I thought one way before I read it, and I thought a different way after. And the idea around essentialism is that we all want to do great things, not good things, but we have a limited amount of time. And in the book, there's a circle picture with arrows going out on every side of it. And that's essentially what most of us do especially business owners, is we have so many things we're spending our time on. And while they may not be bad things, none of them can become great. But if we can focus our time and energy, say we're trying to do five things, but instead we try to do one or two, 
the same amount of effort we have, but focused in the right direction will lead to something great. So this helped me with saying no to things. That the more things I said no to, I was actually saying yes to better things that had much better outcomes. So we have a long list of books. I, I, I love reading and I'm getting book recommendations all the time. But those are three books that, to me, gave me a a principle to apply and it shifted my mindset forever moving forward. Uh, let's look at here. Managing people. Oh, that's a great one. All right, we'll, we'll end on this one. Uh, and let's unpack it and try to get into the weeds a little bit. My, my natural strength is not managing people. My leadership style is we have a common mission. I'm going to fight hard with you. Let's put our head down and go get it. So as a young leader, that's what I did. What's tough is there's a lot of people that aren't wired like me. Thankfully, I don't want a bunch of Stens working at one company. And while they had the desire, they didn't really have the the training, the path. And it led people to getting, they got frustrated. I got frustrated. They didn't feel like they were doing a good job. And that's when I, when I realized good leadership is not just believing in somebody that they can figure it out. And so I needed to give a framework to them. And so this question says, how do you onboard somebody? This is from Luke. It says he has somebody coming on board. He's had another employee for 14 years. So he's not new to having a team member, but he is recognizing, how do I onboard somebody better? I, I am a big believer in like a 30, 60, 90 day onboarding plan. This is something you can have done well in advance for somebody. Uh, and it says, here's the basic things. You know, if 30 days, we want to get you set up on your computer. Uh, you're going to shadow some people, get your benefits set up. Uh, and then I want you, you know, shadowing me in meetings for X period of time. So, so put some framework. It doesn't have to be overly detailed. Uh, that could be better, but ours has not progressed to that point yet. But by time I do a 90-day evaluation, which I do with all new hires, 90 days of probation, let's see this is good fit both ways. I want them to understand what does it look like to be successful in those 90 days? It's not realistic for me. I think they're going to be an expert at that point. A lot of roles I've seen, it takes somebody about 12 months to kind of settle in and get some confidence in their role. Uh, but I do want them to have a clear path, at least for the first 90 days. So by time I do evaluate them, I'm not using just my emotions. Do I feel like they're doing a good job? It's like, no, are they actually delivering on the KPIs and the rocks that we've given to them? So big believer on 30, 60, 90 day plan. Um, the I think there should be some culture training in there. Um, do your core values matter? Does that person that's coming onto the team actually understand your definition of those core values? Uh, that's something I, I hadn't done as much of until recently, which I'm a big believer in now. Um, and then there shouldn't be, there's a big difference between abdication and delegation. Abdication is when you just kind of give something up and walk away. Uh, delegation is, hey, I'm going to give you this thing. What questions do you have? I'm going to let you work on it and I'm going to come back and help you refine it. So I would, I would challenge anybody listening as an advisor. It is a high calling to hire and manage people. Um, because it is partly your responsibility to help them be successful. We're all professionals. You know, if you're you're hiring adults, so they don't you don't need to babysit people, but you do need to be clear. You know, clarity is a gift to somebody. Here's your, here's what your job is. Here's what it looks like to actually be successful, and then potentially here's what it looks like to excel in your role, so people know where they stand. But be be ready for it to be hard. I think if you're if you're managing a team with people, it's just hard. And so if you're frustrated because it's hard, that's going to be a long road. I've learned to try to sit in the tension of that, that there's some weeks where I feel like, man, my team is humming. This is great. And almost the next week I can be like, man, do, do we even know what we're doing? And this is really frustrating. That can be a roller coaster until you learn to say, this is, this is normal. People have lives outside of work that can be distracting. You know, I thought they got it, but they need some training on it. So I would say as much clarity as possible, things like EOS a great system. If you can have a system in place to help, that's a big win. I had to get a practice manager to help me with this because it's not my natural strength. So I want to sit down with people and inspire them, ask great questions, but the day-to-day -day, uh, accountability of action items, just that, that, that's not something I enjoy doing. So I would, I would build this out, have structure around it, be intentional about it. Don't feel like you have to recreate it. There's a lot of resources out there for onboarding people well. Um, that's something within our community that a lot of advisors talk about too. I, I get really frustrated at times, even at myself when I was young, when I was trying to fix every problem, like I was the first one to do it. Any struggle you have right now as an ad advisor running a business, if your frustration right now is personnel, if it's process, if it's revenue generation, you're not alone. 
There's a bunch of us dealing with that. And that's partly why EAN exists is so we can all share ideas and encourage each other. Um, so whatever thing you're struggling with now, know you're not the first one and somebody has solved it in some version. Go research it to help expedite your learning curve. So it doesn't take you years to do what somebody else has done. Uh, great questions today. Uh, we'll do another Q&A episode next month. Submit your questions, please. Uh, I love going through them. It's, it's, a, it's a great challenge to me and my practice as well, kind of thinking through these things because uh, I'm an active advisor just like you. So uh, it, Legacy is always iterating this stuff. I don't think there's a finish line for us as advisors and business owners. We're going to keep getting better and we're going to keep solving higher quality problems. So I, I enjoy it uh, and I'll look forward to talking to you soon.